Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of our friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Boxer, Ebony Bridges, how are you, gorgeous? I'm good, thank you, very well, glad to be here, it's finally come about. The Blonde Bomber? Yeah. <laughs> in the UK, making waves? Yeah. Before we get into all that though, first and foremost, how are you? Good, you know, obviously um, I've got a fight coming up, so I'm pretty deep in camp, um, I'm excited, you know, just head down grafting, and um, yeah, just working it. When is the fight? We'll plug that straight away. Yeah, um, fight 26th of March in Leeds um, for an IBF world title. It's my second world title fight um, against a very good champion in uh, Cecilia Roman from Argentina. So she's the longest reigning champion in the division, uh, most experienced. But that just makes me really hungry and really motivated and inspired. You're fucking always in Leeds, man. Like, what? <laughs> You're in Leeds, man. What? <laughs> More than yeah. Josh Warrington, fuck's <laughs> sake. Hey, hey, hey. All leads, aren't we? Yeah, no, look, um, it's How, in my adopted city now, so it's it's my home away from home. Why Leeds? Leeds United. I think it all came about Leeds United. You know, obviously the football fans, I'm a, I'm a Leeds United fan. Um, and, you know, um, it started there and then just being over here and and being in Leeds and, and having the warmth from the community. I love the community. They're my kind of people, like Yorkshire people, you know, like they just, I can resonate with them and I can really, you know, resonate with that kind of, you know, um, demograph and, and now I just love it. You know, the support's great, um, people great and the team's great. Yeah, they're crazy bastards in Leeds. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, they're crazy and, you know, crazy like me. Like I say, you know, they're, the dirty leads and I'm um, a bit dirty as well, you know, <laughs> in more ways than one. No, but <laughs> no um, it's, it's everything just sits there and then and I feel good there, you know, and um, it's just, it's beautiful and I just like giving back to the community and um, yeah, it's great, great to have, have that love and like a, um, you know, like people that are away from my home, but you know, it makes me feel like home. So yeah. I always go back to the start with my guests. Yes. Where you grew up and how it all began. <laughs> all right. Look, I grew up in Sydney, um, Western Sydney, which has a pretty bad rep, I suppose. Um, it was like Westies, you know, it's a bit of a rough area. Um, and yeah, I grew up there. I've got um, two brothers. I've got a twin brother. Um, my mum and dad are great. You know, my, my, my dad's an artist. Um, mum does lots of things, but she's insurance. Um yeah, growing up with my brothers, it was always like, um, I was like, wanted to be like them. You know what I mean? So I've always been a tomboy my whole life. Um, my parents put us in karate when I was five. They used to like, you know, beating up my brothers. <laughs> but um, yeah, like, you know, that's that's kind of there. And I don't know. Um, yeah. How was school? School, school. I didn't even remember much of school. Honestly, my teens was probably the hardest part of my life. Um, I had a really rough start. Like, in, in, my primary school was really good, but then when I went in the teens, um, a lot of things happened to me, and then I kind of, well, I went way off off track and disconnected from everyone, family, and everything like that. And um, yeah, it was probably rough. I have a lot of traumatic times in my in my teens, um, and I don't really remember much of my teens, if I'm quite honest. Try and block it out. Yeah, block it out. Um, you know, um, I don't know, like where I start, I suppose when I was 13, um, my best friend killed himself. So then obviously that was hard on me. And then like a year and a half, two years later, year and a half later, 
my boyfriend got killed. And then this is only young. I'm 13, I'm 14, 15, you know, and I'm involved with like older people, people that are getting into things. And then I would obviously escape, you know. So I was doing things to escape from all of that. And um, it was just really dark spot and hanging around bad people, seeing bad things, having bad things happen. So yeah, it was um, it was rough for me. And I suppose I blocked it out and, and I took things that just make me think now that I can't remember because I was so flying, <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. Drinking drugs? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, you know. I'm um, pretty excessive though, not like um not like just a bit of weed, you know, so it was pretty bad. But um, yeah, you know, um it all makes you who you are. And, you know, as I get older I look back and I think as much as it was fucked up, it was fucked up and the shit. Like I've never really been a bit of a victim, never been a victim. I've always you know, when I I did change my parents helped me um pull myself out of it when I was about eighteen, but it was a five rough years and um yeah, when they pulled me out, I'm lucky I have a great family that that I come from a good family that could actually, you know, be um, supportive and want to help me. Um, and then, yeah, when I cha- when I decided that's it, like I'm going to change and, you know, I've wasted enough time and, and, you know, I'm not this kind of person, I'm not this, this is not what I do, then, um, yeah, I just made it my mission just to fucking make the most of every single minute, not not waste a minute and um, look back and be like, thank God all that happened because if it didn't, I wouldn't be the woman I am now. It's all the hard stuff that you go through that makes you resilient you know, and makes you think like, makes you realize that that happened to teach you that or that happened to, because of now this, you know, so, and I'm a firm believer and everything happens for a reason. Everything happens how it should. And, um, and it's just how you look at it, you know? Yeah. Your cards are always dealt in life. It's yeah. just how you play them. Like from going through that experience from 13 years old, like those traumatic experiences, they're so tough because there's people in their adult years who can't handle that trauma yeah. so as a kid you don't understand that if you, because you, you're so young that, yeah so it's hard to then disconnect because you don't know how to handle it so we disconnect through exactly. the external stuff to take us away from the pain yeah definitely you know it was hard like i i, I not, don't regret but like my parents like i just like i was so dark and so so like in my own thing trying to escape from everything that i, I lost that connection with my parents i'm just blessed to have a beautiful family do you know what i mean but um yeah, like I always think like we never really had that, I never really had that like mother-daughter thing or, you know, I had like bikers and strippers and drug addicts and, and pretty fucking shit, shit guns, but fuck we, it's like bringing, pretty much bringing me up, you know what I mean? Like all these, that's who I got brought up with, hanging out with bike clubs, hanging out in strip clubs, hanging out in these, all these kind of things, doing drugs and all that, like that's, that's what brought me up most of my teens in that life, you know, but at the same time, it also made me very obviously streetwise and very headstrong and, and, and whatever. But, um, yeah, it's all built me for me now. And then you learn a lot, you know, and, and as much as I'm, I'm not glad it happened, but I am because I, I love the person I am now. I absolutely am so secure in myself and I've, and, um, I'm so proud of myself and how far I've come and just my, everything that I do. How hard is it for your parents to see their daughter slipping? I think it was very hard. My mum, um, always, even now, she's always like, have any, and I, I, I don't usually, I don't talk about it. Like I said, I'm not going into full depth with you. Fuck, because we could be here all day for some of the shit, you know what I mean? But my mum, I think it was the, probably the hardest for my for my mum. She kind of knew what was going on, but she had to keep it to herself. And then I got really out of control and really, really bad. And then we had to kind of share it with, my, with the rest, with my family, my, my dad and stuff. But um, now even my mum's like, you know, Eb, like, I did that celebrity SAS. She's like, yeah, just don't talk about it. Like, because you don't want to live in the past. You don't want to bring up those negative things. And I don't like what to bring up, you know. I purposely don't go into depth and talk about it all because I don't want to be brought up because it is the past. I don't dwell on it. I don't even think about it. But but for my parents and for my family, I think they don't want to be out all the time, everything that I did. They don't want to hear about it. It was a fucking hard time for them too, I think, seeing their daughter, like, you know, disappear kind of thing. They've, you know, so I think... um just for this, you know, comfortability of my family and everyone around me, I think is not something that I really want to, you know, go and, and I touch on t- in, in depth yeah. at the moment. And because I am and I'm in a great life and, I, and I, I love that people can focus on all the positives for me. I don't need the sob story. I don't believe in f- sob stories, sorry, but I fucking I hate that victim mentality. It gets you absolutely nowhere. And um, I don't need the sob story to help me get noticed or help me for people to appreciate me and respect me. If I need to stop story for people to respect me, then fuck it. I don't know. Like, 
respect me for the hard work that I've done and, and all the positives that I've done because ever since I turned my life around, it has not stopped of achieving, 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 yeah. achieving, achieving. But it's not a sob story because the majority of people who listen will be in the same position that you were in. So your sob story can be the strength for somebody else. Yeah. So I feel ashamed about talking about. Yes, the, the past can fucking, it can make you sad and a bit down, but people can realise, okay, she can now cut about in her brand pants and win world titles. And, <laughs> yeah. And look, well, that, so from having a life of misery, losing friends to suicide yeah. to then being a fucking champion of the world to then travelling yeah. the world to then growing a following and then yeah. being happier. Like, people then want to know the, the, the tools and techniques that you yeah. use to get out of that dark place. So even though you don't want to speak about that, your story then helps other people get out of their misery. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, and I totally agree on that. And, um, and, and I feel that, but I'm like, I don't want every time I... Every, for example, this is the first time, this is probably the deepest I've actually talked about it. It's fucking pretty good, James. Thank you. Thank it's you. It's me up straight away. <laughs> it's timing, it's timing. Everything happens for a reason at the right time. Yeah. But I, I do, I don't want to go into it mainly because, um, um, like it was traumatic, but I just don't want it to be brought up constantly. I just see, like, especially in my boxing at the moment where I am, um, it's just a negative for me. And, um, I don't want to, every time I go in the ring, they tell the, they tell the, I'm going to yeah. call the subject. Every time I jump in the ring, oh, you know, Ebony used to do this and she didn't, this didn't happen to her. And this, you know, I just don't, don't really, I'd rather just roll with, you know, all the, all the good stuff and, and not have to be bringing that up all the time. And, you know, a little bit here, then the interviews every time is going to ask me about it. Like, you know, you see people and I'm like, that's all they talk about because people love it. Yeah. And I get they love it, but I don't fucking love it. Yeah. I don't need that. I've got everything else. I've got fucking two degrees and master's degree in mathematics. Like I inspire children. Like I'm happy to do that. But in what you're saying is, I love when I finish boxing and I don't have boxing anymore. That's something I want to do. I would love to do motivation seminars, do tours, tell my story, write a book so you can really fucking see what I've been through. So, you know, and that's when I want to help people. Right now, I want to inspire people, but my goal is boxing and my goal is to be the best that I can be and be in a positive mindset. Right now, as much as I want to inspire people, I don't want to have to bring up bring up my past and talk in depth about it to inspire people. I think I'm doing a pretty good job as it is, but when it's all over and I'm happy to got nothing else to talk about, then yeah, let's talk about it. The and, pain and, and the misery. Let's talk about yeah. the fucking shit. <laughs> and I, mate, I will spill the beans on the boxing industry. Yeah. No, but you know, it's a fucking, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rough sport, that's for sure. No, but honestly, um, yeah, there's a time and a place for everything and I think the time and a place is not now. Um, for for to bring in to really dig deep into it, but yeah, yeah, there's always time for a part two. So don't worry exactly, about that. yeah. So after you started coming out at that period, yeah, like what started happening then? How did you make those changes to then go? Okay, I'm a bit fucked up. I need to make changes. Yeah, so um, I pretty much, um, yeah, I um, I think I was 19, and I started. Um, I said, okay, well, what I want to do? Like, I always wanted to be a teacher, right? So. Um, Why? Because, because of because of kind of what I went through, I always wanted and that that change that I made, um, I wanted to be able to go into the schools and I wanted to necessarily tell my story, but be that person that I didn't have, you know, to believe in, to sh to um, show that if you just believe in yourself, you can do anything. You know what I mean? And and um, I thought, well, I didn't get like a a certificate where I could go to university because. I didn't. I was doing all this other stuff. So I had to um, do some studies to get into university to do all that. So um, I did some um, exercise, oops, yeah, um, like PT and college to do some um, personal training. And I got in the gym and then um, I wanted to challenge myself. I needed a goal. I got a very addictive personality. Um, if it's channeled in the right spot, you know, here we are, you know. And I um, – so I was like, you know, I want to challenge myself. And I was looking at, like, I saw this girl and she was a bodybuilder. And I was like, wow, man, that, that physique is insane. Like, imagine what it would take to look like that, you know. And there'd be a lot of people around going, oh, she looks like a man and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just looking at her body going, wow, that is fucking hard work. And I went up to her and I had a chat to her and I said, you know, what do you do, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, I'll do bodybuilding. And I'm like, wow, you know, like I want to do this. So I would say that bodybuilding – you know how people say with boxing, oh, you know, saved my life, like bodybuilding saved my life, um, boxing saved my life, you know, got me off the street. I feel like that was for me for bodybuilding. Um, I was completely sober for 10 years all through my 20s. I didn't touch a drink, you know, I didn't, nothing, you know. Um, and now I don't even really drink. I might have like a couple of drinks a year, but I just don't touch anything. And, um, but yeah, bodybuilding, just that mindset, man, of, of it's so hardcore. It is so hardcore. Like, you know, everyone's like tries to compare boxing and bodybuilding and it's a different kind of hardcore, you know, um, discipline 
discipline that you need to look like that, um, you know, day in, day out, 365 days a year. There's literally no day off because when you're not in, when you're not in pre-comp trying to get shredded, you're in, you're in off-season trying to get big. And if you, you know, had that mentality where every rep counts, every session counts, you know, there's no, no, you know, there's no, um, no excuses, you know, fatigue's not an option, like all these kind of things that I just embedded in me, you know what I mean? And I just pretty much lived in that goal and, and, um, and, you know, obviously I got on stage, my first, my first competition I won and I just kept winning. And so because I put everything into it and, and, um, I actually ended up not even really, like, like bodybuilding. I didn't really like lifting weights and I obviously didn't like the diet. It was pretty shit, but I just, I just liked winning and I just liked being the best. And I just, um, wanted to push myself, just constantly pushing myself to be better every day. And, and that mentality that I had through bodybuilding, I think is, has taken me, has really built that kind of no excuses, you know, no quit kind of mentality that I have you know, to continue on to now my boxing and absolutely everything else I do. You know, everything I start now, I just can't can't stop. Everything, even I fucking hate it. Even my degree, did my mathematics, you know, degree, my master's degree to do maths when I went to uni. Hated it because I was so stressed every day, anxiety, you know, like wanting to cry every day. Like, why am I doing this? My mum would say, why are you doing it? Just quit, Ebony. Like, look at you, like you're so anxious because I was juggling three jobs and training plus university, like, and travelling five hours a day to get everywhere. Do you know what I mean? So it was like I would sleep like three hours a day, you know, if that, but I'm still trying to get, like, good marks and and trying to pass my thing and, and my mum would just be like, you know, it's look at you, like, it's not healthy and I'm just like, man, I go, if if you quit when you get when it gets hard, you're never going to get anywhere, never. I'm the first person in my family to even finish school, let alone go to university, let alone do a master's degree. And I said to my mum, and it's nothing against her, but I said to my mum, I go, there's a reason I'm the one that does that is, is does everything and I'm, I'm able to achieve because I don't quit because you, you can't have that mentality that, oh, it's so hard, look, you're suffering, like just quit, Ebony, it's not worth it because it is fucking worth it because every time I push through those hard barriers and every time I push through all that shit that other people wouldn't do, the success and the feeling of of achievement is so much more than fucking feeling like shit, do you know what I mean? You just can't, there's no, you can't get away from that, you know, and um, like there's there's no price on that. So, and you wouldn't know, I suppose, unless you are the kind of person that does push through all those barriers, you know what they say, the, it's, the, it's the climb to the top of the mountain that makes the view so exhilarating, you know. Like you can go get a helicopter at the top of a mountain and it looks great, but imagine fucking climbing up there and yeah. getting up there, you know what I mean? How is it though, that no quit mentality, does that come in from the pain of the past or else do you think if you never had that trauma that you wouldn't have got to where you are? No, I definitely think... Or have you always had that drive to... I, I, uh, no, I, I would say it definitely became because I had this thought where when I was younger, like when I went through all that, when I when I obviously made that turn in my life, I was like, I just fucking wasted five years of my life. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like but everything's a lesson. I quit it, lesson. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But this is what I thought, you know, I'm like, I literally quit on myself like that. Like I'm just like gave up on myself for that many times, that, that long. And so then, you know, when I put myself on, that's it. Like I got to stay disciplined and I've got to believe in myself and, and I don't want to ever – give up on myself and nothing's too hard now. What I've been through, what I've been through, every, everything's easy now to a degree. So I thought, then you, then I did bodybuilding and that was a joke. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, that was hard, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, look, it's, um, I think it, like everything, it, it builds my mentality. You know what I mean? I've also been brought up with my parents of um, having my, like I said, my dad's creative, he's an artist and being you, being real, I've always been, been brought up to be an individual. My parents, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, you do it. Whatever makes you happy, don't listen to anyone, you be yourself and, and you stay true to yourself always, you know. So I'm lucky that I've been instilled in that since I was younger. Um, so, yeah, I mean, whenever I wanted to give up, um, I just pretty much said, no, like you're not done yet, like you're not done. And the more you succeed and the more you push through all those barriers, and you get to the end and you, you you tick those goals off, the next one gets easier, so to speak, because you're like, you know what happens, you know what it's like. You know, human nature always wants to quit. You know what I mean? It's our body. Our body wants to do it. Our mind wants to do it when anything gets hard, you know. Um, but you just got to persevere and, and I continue to persevere. And I think it's a, I don't know, you want to believe in manifestation or like positive mindset, but I will literally say everything that I say I'm going to do, I fucking do it. I do it because I just do. 
because I look in my past and I think everything I've said I'm going to do, I'm, I do it and I achieve it. Whether or not that's just because I'm putting that into the universe and I'm putting that in a positive mindset saying, well, I said I'm going to do it and everything I do, I do. So it continues to happen or I just make it happen. I just find a way, you know. I might set a goal and I expect it to happen in two years. You know, that doesn't work. It might take five years. But I just know what's going to happen because I've said I'm going to do it. And I won't, if I don't think I'm going to do it, I'm not 100% in my heart wanting to do it. And I believe I won't actually project it, you know? So, yeah. How was that feeling when you got your degree? I'm not going to, no word of a lie. It is probably the best achievement that I've ever experienced in my life. So still to this day. Um, and I know people go to uni all the time and, you know, it's a degree, but I did it as a later age. I started, I started university at 25, it took me seven years. I was seven years in university. Um, and it was hard. I was working three jobs. I was working in a bar. I was doing um, bodybuilding preps, doing nutrition for people. I was tutoring student, like tutoring kids. Um, and I was training bodybuilding and then transitioned into the boxing. So I was always training like twice a day, sometimes three times a day, plus doing all of this. So it was really hard for me. I'd be going to school with like kids and all that are just at home, like off, living off mum and dad, you know what I mean? Probably not working or just working in a part-time job, but I had to put food on the table. I had to support my training and I had to support my um, you know, my travel and all this kind of stuff. So I had no choice but to work and graft. And then when I did my master's degree, which is a master's in teaching, but mathematics, but um, it was a lot of reading and writing. I chose maths because I didn't read and write. I never read a book in my life. Fucking hated it. Always have. I've never been into reading and writing. Um, and then when I went to do my master's, which you had to do to do teaching, all of a sudden I'm having to read 200 pages a day and write essays when I've never written an essay in my life. You know, so... Um, I actually, it's this is a pretty good story. It's a story I tell my students all the time is my first semester of my master's degree, I failed. I failed two units and I was told that I need to do extra work. I need to do extra classes on how to write because when, when I read and when I write, it was all over the place. It didn't make any sense. They're like, your writing is horrible. Like, you, what do you, you know, like it, it's all over the place. Like it's, it was really, really bad because I'd never written, you know, maths, we don't really write. So, um... I was just winging it. I was literally just winging it. And I couldn't read it. Like, you know, I'm really struggle. I struggle with attention with reading. Um, and I was like, fuck, I can't believe I failed. Like, like, you know, because obviously I don't like failing, but I was like, man, like, what am I going to do? I don't have time to go and do extra, extra classes to learn how to write. I don't even have time to do my fucking master's degree because I'm too busy trying to be a boxer and trying to put food on the table. Do you know what I mean? Anyways, but I don't like to, I don't like to fail and, and, and that, you know, that, that hurt. And I'm like, you know, I can't have this, you know, like I'm not letting this get me. So I was very blessed that I have my partner who's very smart as well. And, and I said to him, you know, like, can you help me? And, um, which I never asked him for help before, but I know he's, he's smart. And I said, like, maybe you can read through my essays for me and see what I'm doing. And when we first, when he first started doing that, he proofread it and we would sit there for about two and a half hours. And he's like, what are you saying? And like, why are you repeating yourself? Like, you've already said this. And like, I didn't know what I was, because I didn't know, you know. And I'm like, and then, and then, and then. And he's like, you need to stop. Like, this is so bad. And I speak three languages. So sometimes I write things. And for me, it makes sense because like maybe, I've, you know, the transition also in another language, like it, it kind of makes sense. Like, and I never really learned English in school. Like I didn't care for it at all, you know. Um, so, yeah, anyways, long story short, because it could go on. Um we got better and better and every assignment he would read and, and um, try and help me through it. And I started getting um, um, distinctions. I don't know if you'd call them and high distinctions. And then, you know, my next, um, my next units, you know, distinctions, high distinctions. And I wasn't sleeping because I'm putting so much effort into it. By the end, he was literally just skim reading because it was so good because I learned, I learned on the job from sitting with him and him teaching me in my own time, but whilst doing my, my assignment, does that make sense? So it wasn't like I was having to actually go get lessons, but I was doing it this way. And then, um, yeah, by the time I graduated my master's degree, I actually got a Dean's Merit Award, which means I, um, I graduated in the top, um, 5% of my cohort. So I actually, I actually, um, graduated with distinctions after failing my first two units. So for me, that is a huge achievement because I, again, I fucking hate reading and I would never read a book in my life, but I had to force myself to read. And the way that I had to actually break down all my research with all the highlighting and all the notes, like it took forever for me because I had to try and understand it. I'm not one of those people that can just like skim read and go, yeah, I'll just make up some bullshit because I literally have to understand it because I can't talk shit, you know? So, but because of that, because of the rigorous studying that I did, my assignments were so in depth and so good that I was getting d 
distinctions and high distinctions and then I graduated at the top of my cohort. So for me, that was an amazing achievement for me and just pushing through all that plus becoming a, you know, a high rated amateur boxer plus then a professional boxer plus everything else that I did. For me, that was a very um, a proud moment for me. Yeah, congratulations. How much does it stay off the drink though? I- make you achieve these goals because it pushes you towards your dreams I believe drinking alcohol takes you two steps back everything in moderation I believe but when you start stopping all the negatives you then opens the door for all the positives like how, yeah. how much was that a big factor in your life for 10 years yeah I mean look um drinking wasn't really the issue for me but <laughs> trust me it was a lot worse than drinking probably the worst you can think of but um yeah I mean drinking or drugs just in general you know they they're they're they 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 um, I just setbacks, you know, all they do is um, hold, hold you back and, and um, it's just really, you know, the day after anything or the week after, like you're not motivated, you know what I mean? Like it's 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 just an escape, like anything, like, you know, um, and when you start on that, it become, obviously it becomes a habit. But I think just in general, like I'm the kind of person that I couldn't do anything like that because I need to be 100%. I'm all or nothing. I'm literally all or nothing. Do you know what I mean? I can't just go out and have a drink. I don't even like alcohol. It tastes like shit to me. Like I don't like actually having a drink. Um, so I'm kind of okay with staying off the drink and I can't just go, okay, yeah, let's just have a beer or a cider or a wine with my dinner. I just don't enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? Um, but drinking and drugs and like things for me, say for when I was younger, you know, you start when you're 12, 13 smoking weed and then it just goes into this and then it goes into that. And then like, before you know it, you're in a fucking dark, dark hole doing shit that's fucked up. Do you know what I mean? So, and I believe in that and, and I'm such an, I'm not anti, like I'm, I'm, I am obviously anti-drugs because of my, my past, but it's true. Like you don't know, it can just take one thing in your life that will just send you down that fucking, that hole, you know, and then people were all like, you know, it's just a bit of weed or it's just a bit of alcohol. But before you know it, something's happened and that's your escape. And then, you, then you're all fucked up. You know what I mean? And, and it's hard for me. It wasn't that bad for me in my teens until my parents found out or until people found out because it was my secret which only my close-knit people, people I was involved with knew about. And it wasn't until people find out what you're doing that you're like, fuck, okay, this is pretty bad. Because when it's your secret, like, you know, it's like it's just your thing, you know, you're not affecting anyone really, you know, you're just doing your thing and trying to get through life. But then when you see it, uh, how it affects your family and how it is when they they respond to it, I think that's, for me, was like a real wake-up. Do you know what I mean? The kind of I was like, okay, yeah, like I know it's bad, but it's not that bad because it's my secret. You know, but then when it becomes known, it's um, it's kind of yeah, it's it's a lot worse. Yeah, denial was a big part of it as well. Yeah. for any age, because we always think we're fine. When I was taking gear and drinking all the yeah. shit, I had it well because I was a big handsome bastard. Yeah. So <laughs> nobody seen the telltale signs. Yeah, but when you're sitting in a house sniffing your fucking brain out for yeah. four days straight, the questions then start to take, and then the agitation starts, and then the yeah, anger. People saying there's something up with you, and it's yeah, I'm fine, yeah. I'm fine, I'm fine, and then yeah. It took me many, many years to make changes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, look in my teens. The thing is, I still went. To, I still went to school. I still did things. Like I said, I was blessed. I came from a good family and a good upbringing, so I had morals. Always had morals. Always had respect, and you know, all this kind of stuff. It was just I was just in the wrong path. You know what I mean? But I still had that that those values from the from the start. I think I feel sorry for some people that don't have have that, or they don't have the family support, or their family's in denial. The family doesn't help. Do you know what I mean? My brother disowned me. Do you know what I mean? And that was hard for me. Like it was, it was, it was all like really, really rough. But I feel like you know, because I was able to still go to school and I was still able to get by with what I was doing. Um, it was like, it's okay, Ebony. Like, I'm not doing anything really bad for it. I'm, you know, like I'm not, uh, you know, whatever, selling myself. I'm not doing anything like that. You know what I mean? I'm just, my, it's just my escape. It's just what I do, you know? Um, and yeah, so it was like, it wasn't until people find out and you see the effects around people and then you kind of get a bit of a wake up call, you know? And, um, you're like, yeah, this is yeah, pretty fucked. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, people, and you need help, yeah. you know. People can still function on it. And oh, definitely. Because I know plenty of people still take what they take and oh, still my, go to the gym, go to course, work and they think yeah. they're fine. But yeah. you gradually see their face changing. Yeah, you gradually see them changing, yeah. their energy, their presence, yeah, their aura. Everything yeah, changes. Definitely. And the scary thing is people do detach family members, friends. And that's yeah. the hard thing because you think, well, fuck them then. Yeah. And then you start getting more ego and pride we think well yeah. they don't love me yeah. but they only you, pull away because they actually do love you yeah, yeah, yeah. you know yourself if you want to make changes you need to dig deep yourself within yeah for sure no cunts coming to save you chap <laughs> your door and says let's nah. go and change your shit yeah yeah I mean it was kind of like um, like with with my parents the first thing well actually because my, my parents kind of 
kept it. I had to go and sort myself out. And obviously then my, my brothers and other family found out. But before that, my and I'd, I'd, my my brother was my twin brother. I was like, "You got my twin my my twin sister back, like, tw- like because they didn't realize like it was because I'd been off stuff, you know what I mean? And and they're like like I was coming a bit back how I was a little bit. But I found it all through my teens. Whenever I tried to quit, because I knew I had to stop, you know, I had to stop things. And I try many times, and my mum will be like, "You're on drugs." I'm like, actually, today I'm fucking not. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's just because I'm different, you know, because they were so used to me being on, on everything every day or whatever that that was normal Ebony now. You know, she's just dark and she, that's her, but when I'm not on it, you know, it was obviously different. So then they seen that as me being on drugs and well, I'm going to take you down to the doctors and get drugged down. I'm like, all right, let's go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's tough, you know, but um, it, it, it teaches you a lot and and one day, you know, um, I'll go a lot more in depth about it and and really, but just hopefully touching on it a little bit can show that you can change your life around. And and to be honest, I, I push that message so much and that it's never too late to change. I started boxing when I was 30. I'm 35 and it's my second world title fight in a couple, in a month. Do you know what I mean? And, and um, you know, I, it's, it's, it's really, it isn't, even with the kids in school, I see the kids in school and I can see, I can resonate and I can, I see the signs of some of the kids and I run, and, um, well, obviously this year I've, t- I've been overseas, so I'm not, not working, but in every school that I've taught at in the last five, six years, I've ran boxing programs for disengaged girls, for anger, mis- uh, anger yeah. issue girls, um, for the anxiety girls, you know. So they come and they'll train with me once a week and it's all about that positive mindset, positive relationships, self-belief and just giving, not being their teacher but being almost like a life coach to these girls because I see the signs in them and I see letting them know and and, and not talking too much about in depth but just letting them believe in themselves, you know, and being in a good environment, a positive environment and teaching them how to use their, their mind and, and that mentality, you know, and I do the same thing when I'm in a classroom. It's all about, for me, it's all mentality. Forget learning, like learning and, and the st- stuff you've got to le- learn in school, right? Because you can't learn that if you're not receptive. And if you don't understand and you don't have the mentality and the mindset to want to learn, to want to improve, to want to be better, you're not going to give a fuck. You're not going to care. So my classrooms, my classroom starts with, and when I get my new classes and all the kids know that they've been with me, but if I have a new class, you know, they, they, they it starts from square one. This is my classroom. This is what you got to do. I've got classroom rules. One of my classroom rules, my fourth classroom rules, rule is banned words. You, you're not allowed to say, I'm done, I can't, it's too hard. They're banned in my classroom. If you say that, you've got to come back at lunchtime and write lines of affirmation. I can, I'm capable, I'm smart. They fucking hate it. They think it's fucking lame. They literally hate it. And they're like, well, this is gay. You know what I mean? Like, that's what they say to me. And I'm just like, no, it's not lame. Like, it, you know, it's it's... You need to stop talking down on yourself. When I first became a teacher, I was taught in a very low class, a very um, school that was um, um, it was part of a disadvantaged schools program, Aboriginal school program. Um, it's it was very known for like um, government housing, very rough, and all the kids were doomed from the time they popped out of their mum, their junkie mums. You know what I mean? Like, and the teachers in that school thought that as well. I remember going there and, oh, you know, the kids are just not that capable. They don't want to learn. I'm like, that's because you don't want to fucking teach them because you don't want to teach them because you don't think that they're capable. Start letting them believe that they're capable. And I let all my students know that they're capable. No matter what level they are, they're fucking capable. Then they might not be at advanced yet, but they're still capable to be better. They just got to try. And 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 so I push that into their minds and, and that positive mindset, those banned words, it's training them to teach, to talk well about themselves and to stop the negative self-talk. I nearly cried one of the first few times when I started at school. I was like, I can't believe these kids, all they do is talk so bad about themselves. I'm going to get emotional talking about it because all they do is talk so bad about themselves. (laughs) And I hate it. Does that remind you as yourself as a kid? Of course. You know, and I hate seeing people do that. And I hate kids that don't believe in themselves because that's where it starts. (laughs) <laughs> yeah you're fine <laughs> but look how far you've come and the amazing thing about life I am is important but belief is a key ingredient for any recipe to make changes in your life having that self belief is so important that you can achieve anything your prime example coming from the pits of hell to then making something for your life but this is only the beginning of your your journey as well yeah. like you've got so many chapters of your life which is important and, and 
planting these seeds in these kids is very important as well because some teachers are miserable bastards. How many successful people do you hear their teachers saying you're never going to amount to nothing? Yeah, 100%. And Les Brown always says that, that people's opinion of you doesn't have to be at reality. No. Meaning that people get taught you can't be a boxer. Why do you want to be a football player? Why do you yeah. want to be this? Why do you want to be that? But it's all down to self-belief. You've yeah, got definitely. to dig deep. And I am is very important because no matter what you say, whether it's a joke or it's true, the universe doesn't know. The brain no. doesn't know what's real or what's fake. Exactly. So if you're putting that out there, you're going to automatically exactly. believe it. And affirmations are important yep. for keep repeating. I, I do affirmations every morning to tell myself yep. I love myself. I am yep. happy. I am the best in the world. That I repeat that shit consistently. And over the last three years, all this stuff has manifested into my, my existence. So the, the shit does work. Obviously with hard work ethic as well. But so when you're doing the teaching stuff, then something that you're clearly passionate about, why the fuck do you then go j jump from <laughs> something that's safe to then putting your life in danger? Because <laughs> I just like to be a walking contradiction. No, you look honestly. Um, I I do it just because I love it. You know, honestly, I, I love fighting. I've, I I started like I said from the start. I started karate when I was younger. I got my black belt in karate, so I was dedicated to that. I've always been into martial arts. Um, after my bodybuilding, and I was done with that and achieved everything in that. I was like, oh, what do I want to do? Like, you know what? Like, I like bashing people up. To be honest, I've got some obviously clear. Like, still got some anger issues inside of me, and, and I do like hitting people, and I do like fighting, and I, I've always loved it. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I well, might as well do what I love and get paid for it. And um, yeah, that was it. That was just something I thought that I, was, that I loved. I'm a big boxing fan, and um, I just thought, well, let's let's go down. Let's challenge myself here. And when I started boxing, <clears throat> like I said, I had my first amateur fight two weeks before my thirtieth birthday. And when I went to start boxing, I didn't say, I just want to box. I said, I want to fight. And I remember going into the gym and I smoked. I was like a fucking, I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. That was like my fucking, what do you call it? My vice. A little yeah, my blanket. little vice, like a little vice was my cigarettes. Anyways, but I started boxing and I was like, I have to get rid of this shit because it's, fucking, it's hard enough as it is. Anyways, and a little bit into the boxing and I was like, why, Ebony? Did you say you wanted to fight? This is fucked. This is so hard. I haven't even ran for 10 years. Bodybuilders don't run. I don't run across the road. I might lose the muscle. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like now I'm having to do all this exercise. I'm having to do all this cardio, all this agility, all this shit that, um, you know, like I've, my body's like, what are you doing, Ebony? You know? And um, I remember sitting there and I got so many injuries because the transition obviously from bo bodybuilding to boxing is so different. So I got a lot of injuries and a few times I was like, clearly – Someone upstairs does not want me to box, like, because I'll get an injury and then I'll work around it and then I'll get another injury. I'm like, man, I'm never going to get in this ring. Like, I'm never going to fight with because I just keep getting setbacks and setbacks and setbacks. I'm like, no, Ebony, you said you wanted to fight. Don't be a fucking pussy. You said you wanted to be fight. So you cannot actually stop your mission until you get in there and have that fight. And when you have that fight, once you've had a fight, if you don't want to do it no more, that's all right, but you've done the fight because that's what you said you're going to do. My first fight, amateur fight, I broke the girl's nose, second round. And so it only lasted like two and a half minutes. And I was like, that's it. I was like, fuck, I need to do that again. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like I, I went through all this shit and now that was it. So then that, that became my addiction, obviously. And then, you know, really the rest is history. But I just put everything in my boxing. I loved it. Um, I loved everything about it, the training, obviously, and pushing myself. And and um, just, you know, when I go into the gym, I can just zone out of everything in my life and just, you know, just work on my boxing and, and you know, go into that. So, um, yeah, I mean, unreal. Um, and here I am. You know, it's um, it's great. And you know what? Actually, I was actually a card girl in, all through my 20s, a ring girl, because I loved boxing. And a lot of people might not know this, but in Australia, it was actually combat sports was illegal until 2008. It was for women, for women. So we couldn't actually fight. So I did all this like martial arts and I did all this um, kickboxing and, and stuff in my teens, but we couldn't fight. And I love boxing and I love the fights so much, Muay Thai, kickboxing, all of it. So I was like, well, I want to be at the fights and I want to get in the ring. So... I'll just do a do ring card, you know, and I was obviously fit. Um, so, um, yeah, I did that. And then I transitioned from ring girl to them fighting. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it was good. Everyone was, like, obviously, like, what the hell? Like, when you holding the cards? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, now I'm going to bash you guys up, you know. But, um, no, nah, it was, it was, it's been such a whirlwind of a story and, 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 and a life. And everything that I've done 
everything that I've done has led me to this point now. You know what I mean? Like my martial art background, discipline when I was doing karate, like the stuff that we used to do then is probably really fucking illegal now if they did that to kids. <laughs> now when I was, you know, we're talking like 30 years ago, like I think it was, it was like Cobra Kai shit. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, so I, I kind of built that discipline there and then obviously going off track, but it all kind of led to this point, you know, me doing my bodybuilding. Sometimes I think I wish I started boxing earlier because I'm a bit older now, you know, and it is, I don't have much time. Um, but then I think if I'd started boxing earlier, I wouldn't have had, um, you know, the power and the strength that I have from the body meal. And I might not have had that mindset that bodybuilding really instilled into me, you know, like that hardcore, like shit that, that, that I take into boxing, you know? So yeah, I'm, like I said, a big believer and everything happens for a reason at the right time. What was it like turning pro? <laughs> it was, obviously I, look, I've always been a fan of, boxing, pro boxing. I never wanted to be an amateur. I've never even watched an amateur fight until I had a fight. You know what I mean? Um, but I knew that for me to, you know, box or pro box, that I would have to obviously get experience up, you know. And um, I, my first fight, um, my first professional fight um, was on pay-per-view TV, um, Fox Sports, which is big, obviously, channel in Australia. It's like Sky Sports on the undercard of Tim Zoo. Um I was absolutely fucking shitting myself, you know. I was like, but I was excited because I'm like, this is what I'm, this is what I'm made for, you know. This is what I'm born for. I knew I was born for the big stage. I knew I was born for this, you know. And I just wanted to go out and like just smash. In the first ten seconds, I got clipped with a flash knockdown and snapped my ankle. <laughs> yeah, that was fun, mind you. I didn't know that I'd been like knocked down because I got straight back up and it was like a blackout. And the, the refs counting me. I'm like, what the fuck? You see it in the video. I'm like, I didn't even get hit. Like, I'm thinking, why is he counting me? Because I literally just blacked out, like, and I got up and then I went to walk and my ankle was fucked. And I was like, oh, I just rolled my ankle and he's counting me. And I'm, all these things are going through my head. Like, they can't give you a standing eight count. Like, this is the, not the amateurs. Like, anyways, and I just thought, I clicked out and I'm like, oh, she's fucking dead now because now I'm down a point because I just got some eight count for nothing. <laughs> this is all in my head, right? So I just smashed the shit out of her. I ended up, because it was in the first 10 seconds, I actually ended up winning that round back. And then um, I run the next three rounds. Um, and got, you know, got the win. But then because I did snap my ankle, um, I had to go to the hospital the next day and um, had surgery, two surgeries. I was on crutches. I didn't walk for nearly three months. Um, had to learn to walk again. And fucking headbutting the mic there. Yeah, had to learn to walk again. And that was a real a fucking another setback, you know, where I was just like, that actually taught me so much, you know, um, because I was on top of the world. I'm like, I finally made my pro debut because my first pro debut fell through. So I finally made my pro debut. After the fight, I had the promoters messaging me, oh, we, we've got a four fights this year. Like, we want to get you on. You know, that was an exciting fight, you know. But I'm like, mate, I don't know how long I'm going to be out for. Like, I might have to have surgery. Like, you know, they're saying like, you know, six months. Like, you know, like it was – and they're like, oh. So that was like, oh, my dreams are starting to come true. And then it was just like, I'm just going to fucking take them away from you, you know. And um, it was really hard for me. The first 10 days I was, you know, drugged up in painkillers. And then when the painkillers wore off, I was like, fuck, I need to go to doctors and get more drugs, you know. And I started, because I was obviously depressed and I'm like, I don't want to think about, you know, I was kind of going into that bad mindset again where I'm like, I just want to escape. I just want to escape my thoughts. I want to escape the fact that now, you know, my life's over and my, everything, because, you know, it's all over. That's what my, my, I went dramatic. I was like, oh, it's all over. Everything I've worked for and sacrificed and all this, it's all over now. Like, you know, and then I said, no, Ebony. Like, and I fucking, like, not hit myself in the head, but, like, I, you know, snapped out of it. I go, what the fuck? Don't be a fucking victim. Don't be, feel sorry for yourself. You, you just snapped your ankle. Like, you got it. You, you still got two arms. You still got another leg. I'm like, you know, like, you're not dead. You're not in, a, like, a wheelchair. Like, you know, you, you're, you're still okay, Eb. Like, you know, um, even though I had to sit down in the shower on a chair. Actually, that got quite comfortable to sit in the shower. It was quite relaxing. <laughs> but I couldn't stand in the shower because of my ankle, right? Anyways, so I said, well, what can I do? Well, I can't obviously run and I can't box, but I have an upper body and I can lift weights. And I hadn't lifted weights for years because I get completely left the weights after bodybuilding. I was like, I'm done with that shit. But I'm like, well, you know, I need to do something. I can't just sit around and feel sorry for myself. And so I was very blessed that I had a friend that would pick me up and take me to the gym every day and because um, he worked at the gym. And so I got up to the gym and just start pumping weights again, you know, and um, just for those endorphins and just a positive. And then, you know, I'd be in the crutches at the gym, walking around and all the people, the PTs at the gym, helping me with all the equipment because I couldn't put my foot down, I couldn't walk, but I could get the chair and I could sit down and do lifts and, and all that kind of stuff. And so I just did that and I practiced a lot of more affirmations and meditation and I'd never done meditation much before, but... Um, I was like, well, I need to do something to keep me sane. I've just gone from 
working three jobs, training twice a day and studying to now not even be able to leave my fucking house because I can't drive because i got a snapped ankle and I go crazy. You know what I mean? So I had to think of other things to do. So I started with that positive mindset, with more affirmations, with um, meditation, with focusing on what I just, it's that, what I learned about that is focusing on what you can do, you know, and I, and I preach that, you know, when something bad happens, there's always something you can do, you know, and so that's what I did. And I started drawing again. I hadn't drawn for a long time. If you see my drawings, but I, you know, and that was great for me. I, now I continue to draw. Didn't realize for me because I stopped drawing when I was in my teens because of the, obviously what I was going through. And but I was always a drawer. And now I do it to not to escape, but drawings like my escape because drawing or mathematics, either of them to switch my mind off from from everything. So if I'm feeling really anxious or I'm feeling like really stressed, I'll start drawing. So I did all this kind of stuff, and then I had a coach at the time as well, and. And the, I had my pro debut with, and they, that was just a fucked up, you know, environment. He was quite narcissistic, and and having that ankle, uh, snapped ankle gave me a way to get away from that, which I was kind of on myself. I didn't have a coach for a little bit, and I was a bit lost. But then now, then I got my other coach, and anyways, long oh, fuck, this, we could be here forever. It's a fucking long story, but I um, yeah, and, and then I got my good coach, and then here I am. You know, it's, it's just. It's just crazy. Like when I look back, I, I really, and this is why I preach it, everything that happens for a reason. I've snapped ankle. I felt like my life, I thought that was it. My dreams are over. But this amount of good that came out of that, the shit that I learned about myself, the mindset that I learned from that, you know, like the truth about those affirmations and just being positive and f working around things and, and focusing on the positives and what you can do, being grateful, waking up with gratitude, you know, waking up and being, I'm so grateful that I've got two arms and I can still go to the gym and train something. I'm so grateful that I have food on the table. I'm so grateful that, you know, I'm able to do this. And I'm uh, gratitude is fucking huge. You know, whenever you, whenever you, I feel like it, when everyone asks me for advice, if they're down or whatever, I go, you know what, focus on gratitude and be thankful for the things you do have. I'm not saying that you should look at other people and go, well, they're worse off. So, I should feel happy, you know, where they say, oh, there's people worse off for you because it's not that everyone has their own story and their own things and you shouldn't be comparing to other people. But there's always something you can be thankful for, just the fact that you're breathing, you know what I mean, or, or there's something you can find for a beautiful fucking day in this ugly London weather, thankful for a nice sunny day today. Do you know what I mean? And it's those, it's, it's positiveness. It's that positive mindset that gets you through, you know, and pulls you out. So, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I'm preaching, preaching now, but yeah. How was it going through it? See, when you were on the, the the prescription drugs as well, seeing you were slipping, did, mm. were you scared that you you went full fucking bloodied again? Yes and no. Um, no uh, at first, I mean, I, do you know what it was? When I went to the doctors to get the new more prescriptions, so I went to the doctor and I said, can I get some more um, medication? He's like, no, you shouldn't need it anymore. It's like, it's been ten, like, you should be fine. You don't You don't need it anymore. And when he said that, I'm like, you know what? You're right. I don't need it. I actually don't need it. I'm not really in pain. I just wanted to sleep my days. I just wanted to sleep my days. I just wanted to sleep through my days so I didn't have to deal with the fact that I felt like my dream was over. Do you know what I mean? Um, so that was a bit of a wake up to me. Not a wake up, but I was like, you know what? You're fucking right, doc. I don't need them. So then I went home and that's when I changed my mind. Um, I'm pretty strong willed. I feel like, um, I don't know. I don't, uh, I mean, sometimes I, 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 I'll be lying if I say sometimes I just don't think, fuck it, I wouldn't mind just going doing that. Like, I think about that every day. Yeah. Like I, I think you know I, I, I wouldn't say it's every day, but sometimes when I get really, really, really stressed yeah, I'm, every I'm, day, I've got constant good and evil here. Is it? Yeah. Constant. Fuck the podcast. Rip the ceiling down. Drink drugs. Women. Yeah. Fucking. Go, yeah. go fucking mental. And then other times think how far you've come. Like it's a constant. Yeah. Good and evil every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've yeah, like. I'd say I did relapse after ten after ten years. Like I said, I was ten years sober. I did relapse, but it was just a once off, and then I was just like, oh. how was that feeling for you? It was like I started and I couldn't stop. And then I was like, fucking hell, like, you're fucking, what the fuck? You know what I mean? And then I just knew the next day, I was like, I can't do that again because it actually didn't get me anything. <laughs> it was like, why did you do that? You know, so, um, yeah. But um, so now, I, I, to be honest, I, I look at that day now whenever I think about things and I think, do you remember how you felt? It didn't even feel good. Like, it literally solved absolutely fucking nothing, you know, so don't even bother. Like, that's where my mindset is with all that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, yeah. If when I, when I, I don't know, yeah, when I think about it, like, I, I, I still think, like, obviously, if anyone was to ask me, I'm like, it's fucking great. <laughs> like, you know, but, yeah, anyway. Yeah, 10 years a lot. I've done two years off everything. 
had a drink and went off the rails for a full year. Oh, really? Full yeah. fucking year. But then I realised how good I felt within the two years when I was off it. I was a better man. I was a yeah, better father. I was a better friend. That I got more done. And then that's me over three years now. No drink, no drugs. Yeah, amazing. And yeah, well done. What I'm achieving is exactly is second to none. And, but it's still scary because with come success becomes more pressure, becomes yes. more envious, becomes a lot of negatives with the positives as well so it's trying to yes. overcome that every day yeah definitely I mean even me like obviously with the success I get um, I have a lot of love and I have a lot of fans but um, I it doesn't really affect me you know too much but I do get negatives sometimes but I just always remind myself that you know these people one they don't know you you know and they just people project their own shit onto you you know the way people treat you and the, the stuff that people say it's always really about them and you can't let what other people think um affect you because you've got to be confident and secure in yourself you know what I mean I was being brought up sticks and stones will break your bones but words will never hurt you you know I fucking lived by that you know like uh you can say anything about me I'm like you don't fucking know me I love who I am you don't know what I've been through you know go fucking work on yourself and stop focusing on others, you know. And the pressure gets hard for me. And I just do know with more popularity and more fame, it only gets worse, more people trying to drag you down. And the hardest thing is when it's people close to you. I've had that where I think, wow, I can't believe you fucking portrayed me like that or I can't believe it's you. Like all the shit that I've done, you know, and, you know, when you think that people close to you, that's the fucking worst. But, again, you got to think it's their fucking problem, not my problem. And it's fucking sad. You got to feel sorry for these people. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I I don't know. Like I think I'm okay. I don't think I I don't know. I, I suppose I've got goals. Who knows what it would be like when I don't have goals and and I'm, I feel lost. But I would hope to hope that I'm you know strong enough and and I'll, yeah. always, I'll always have something that I'm working on. And I have so many big goals and visions for myself. Like I said to you earlier. After my boxing, I want to do tours. I want to do motivation seminars. I want to spread my mindset that I've learned through the fucking hell that I've been through over and over again through every part of my life. There's always been something, you know what I mean? There's always been hard times, even in boxing, mate. Like it's fucking people just see this. success. oh, the blonde bomber. She gets everything. She's pretty, you know. She gets everything because she looks the way she looks. And what I'm like, mate, you have fucking no idea. To be where I am, I'm dealing with a lot more fucking shit than the guys that are fucking... Do you know what I mean? Not on a big stage. Like the shit that you go through, like to be the, the work and graft that I do everything myself. I set up all, I do all the PR myself. I do all, most of the managing myself. You know what I mean? I, I do all my social media. I do everything myself. I would love to have someone to do it for me, but I just don't trust anyone. You know what I mean? Too many people, you know, th th I just don't have that trust. And hopefully one day I can find someone that I believe that can can really help me. You know what I mean? But until then, unfortunately, I take it all on myself. So not only am I a professional box, but I'm also doing everything else, you know? Yeah, because that adds a lot of pressure on it. does. Right? Because social media is just as poisonous yeah. as any drug. Yeah, definitely. So you need to be careful. But to promote your brand, you still need you to have to do it. Hour. So I'm the same. I do everything myself. Yeah, it's part of it. I've got my editor and stuff, St Stephen, but I just, I just, work better when I'm under pressure I work better yeah. when I'm alone because I know I've, I can't let anybody else down but myself yeah exactly if you want I wouldn't believe it. if you want something done you got to do it yourself yeah fucking I swear like it really is like that because I've even asked people and I try and get people to do things I'm like it's, they're not doing it or I'm waiting too long and and I'm I'm a bit impatient I understand things take time but I'm also the only person that's that I, there's no one else out there that's going to want what I want as much as me. No one's invested in your dreams and in your goals as you. They can say they are, they're part of it, but it's, you can't accept, you can't accept, you can't expect someone else to be as invested in you and your dreams as you are yourself. You know what I mean? And so that's why I just have to go after it because I'm the best person to go after it, you know? So it's hard. It's hard. Made a lot of sacrifices, you know? How hard is it to be a female boxer? How, what? Is there a lot more pressure, do you think, from female combat sports? Depends who you are. For me, um, I think I think I've got it pretty good, but it's also because of the work that I've put in, you know what I mean? And and the the sense that I have with with marketing and business and I know how the I know how it works. I'm very highly um socially intelligent as well, you know what I mean? So all these kind of little things help, you know. And for me, I I'm loving women's boxing at the moment, you know. I um yeah, it's thriving. It's it is thriving, but it is hard for us in the sense that like, you know, we can we can talk about, you know, the equal stuff, like you know everyone talks about equal pay and stuff. But how can you expect to get equal pay when we're not doing the fucking revenue? I understand that. It's not even about boxing, number one, is an entertainment sport. It's not a sport like football or, or rugby. It's a, it's a purely an entertainment sport. So 
it doesn't really matter that you're putting yourself at risk because that's what you're meant to do because that's what it that's what it that's the sport you know that's what it is so for us to say oh, we which we are putting ourselves just as much risk as the boys and all these kind of stuff we're training just as hard doesn't matter if we're not bringing in the views and we're not got that commercial value where are we expecting to get the money from so i under, i totally understand that but i also think that there's still such a big pay gap in between say me with my commercial value for there's another man with similar commercial value we're not getting paid the same yeah we're getting paid a lot more now than we were. And you've got to be fucking very thankful for that. You've got to understand things take time, especially changing society's views and changing a long, you know, standing thing of, you know, women shouldn't fight, you know, and that's going to take a lot of time for, for the world and society to open up. I feel like maybe in 10 years, you know what I mean? But the fact is we're making progress and progress is key. If we're not making progress, then that's a problem. But as long as you're progressing, might not be at the speed that we want, but you got to know how the world works. You know, if you look back five years ago, we've made a fucking huge progression. So think another five years, you know what I mean? Um, I think um, women's boxing, I, I feel like depending on who you are, you know, like anything, you know, you, you need to sell yourself. It's a product, you're, you know what I mean? I totally believe that. It's not too hard for me because that's what I do. But as world champions out there, that aren't even known, you know, because they're not selling themselves. They're not no one pushing them either. You know, obviously we have Eddie Hearn helping now and you've got everyone else jumping on the, on the wagon to help women's boxing. And, you know, last year they were just jumping on the wagon, you know, because that was the thing to do because, you know, we've got to do it. But now I'm seeing that actual promoters, especially Americans, um, are starting to believe a little bit more too, like Eddie Hearn. Do you know what I mean? And these old school guys are starting to really believe in women's boxing. And that's you need, like anything, you need the passion. You need the passion and belief for something to be successful. And the more fans that we get, the more passionate fans we get, more passionate and and um, promoters we get, and people are really believing in the sport. Trainers, even, you know, it's hard being a f- female fighter because we don't get paid like the men. You get a world title fight, and your trainer's like, "Is that all I get?" But it's a world title fight and I've got to put in the same effort with you as I've got to do with the boys and that's all we're getting. And they, that doesn't motivate trainers. Like, fuck, I don't want to train women. Get paid fucking pennies. You know what I mean? But they, you've got to hopefully find trainers that are going to invest in you and believe in you and just believe in the process. You know what I mean? So, yeah, and also I'm going on with so many fucking tangents. But you know what's hard for me is because of the way I look. Oh, sh- she must have fucked away at the top. Oh, you know, she's fucking, she's not, she's only there because she's fucking sucking dick. Or she's fucking, you know, uh, it's got nothing to do with her talent. Like, you know, it's her tits because she gets her tits out, you know, laundry, I wear lingerie. Fuck me. I'm wearing underwear just like everyone else. Yeah, I got mad bolt-ons. I look good. I'm fit. But that doesn't get me yeah. shit. It's all the other stuff that I'm doing, including building my brand, including my intelligence of putting my name out there, including the fucking graph that I do in the gym day in, day out. You can't outwork me. Every trainer that's trained with me, you ask them, you can talk to Tibbs now because he's obviously training me at the moment, but they all say the same thing. I graft harder than anyone, you know, and that's with me, with everything in my life. And I say it to my students. Can I go on an example here? I, I, fuck, how long have we got? I got a student. So when I went back to school in November, just last year, I went back after being over here and everywhere for a year and I just went back for some casual work and the kids obviously asking me about everything. You know, that me is like, you know, whatever. And they just came back from lockdown and they said to me, oh, you know, but um, I don't, why don't you want to do it me? It's like, we've had four months off. Like, what's the point? You know, we've only got like a month left of school. Like, there's no point. I go, no point. I go, I teach, I teach at a sports school. And I'm like, no point. I go, do you go out and like you get a goal scored against you in the first 10 minutes of your game, in your football game, and you go, fuck it, we're losing. That's it. What's the point? I go, is that the kind of athlete you are? Because if that's the kind of that's a shit mindset. And I go, that's exactly what you're doing now in the classroom. You go, oh, well, you know, the last four months are nothing and I've only got a month left, so what's the point of trying? You know what I mean? And like that's like, you know, and I say, if you're all that kind of athlete, then you're never going to get anywhere. If you're going to go to halftime and you're lost and you're down and you're going to go you come and you're that kind of player or that kind of team that comes out in the second half and just gives up because you're already down, like that's shit. And I go, you're not going to get nowhere with that mentality. You're not going to get that. And, and that same mentality you're putting here in this classroom of wanting to give up just because of all that, 
you're going to put it in your sport, you're going to put it in your career, you're going to put it in everywhere. So it all starts here, and I say it starts in the classroom, but it starts no matter what. You have to have that mindset in every, in absolutely everything that you do. You know, it's not just like you go to the gym and train hard and then just give up on the rest of your fucking, on all, everything else. You know what I mean? You want to put it into your relationships, you want to put it into the gym, you want to put it into your studies, into your work. You need to have that mindset in everything. And when you do that, that's when you become so successful in everything, you know, and I try and teach that, obviously. And, and the best way, to, obviously, is to do it with sport, with the kids, you know. But it is true. No one likes, you know, no one's going to get nowhere if, if you just give up when, when it gets hard or you give up because you're down, you know. What was it like winning a world title? I fought the world title. I didn't win it. Um, but it was great to get the opportunity. Obviously, I got the call from Eddie Hearn after f I had four weeks preparation for it. And, um, yeah, obviously a tough fight, Shannon Courtney, my rival. Oh, so that was just for the belt then? That was just for oh, the I belt. I thought you had the belt and Shannon won it. No, no. I got the call up. I'm all, I, well, I originally had the belt in Australia. I was supposed to fight for someone else. Anyways, it got, it's, a, it's a long story, but pretty much it ended up being, um, ended up me and Shannon having to fight for it. Um, yeah, so what was that? So what was this, the script with you and Shannon Courtney for the world title? So you never had the belt? The, the no, it was, was a vacant. vacant. It was vacant. Yeah, it was a vacant belt. Was that and your first time in the UK? It was my first time in the UK, but I'd already built up a huge fan base in the UK just through COVID. Because during COVID, I was just smashing out interviews. I was trying to get my name out. I was letting people see the Blonde Bomber. Everyone fell in love with the Blonde Bomber. They didn't even see me fight yet. You know what I mean? But they fell in love with the Blonde Bomber as a personality because of my interviews and they're seeing me on Twitter and they're having conversation. I'm very accessible to my fans because I love to talk to people. I love to meet people and I just love to be accessible, you know. And um, so, you know, and there was all this question about me. Oh, she's just a laundry model. She just she can't even fight. Like we don't – because they hadn't seen me, you know. This was my haters obviously. But then I had the fans that just – they just were supporting me as the Blonde Bomber, that, you know. Like they were just fans of, of Ebony Bridges, you know. It wasn't even about the boxing. So then when I went into that fight with Shannon Courtney, obviously I had a huge fan base here already. Um, and um, that rivalry, she hated everything that I did, you know, because – I don't know, because well, she wanted to do it, but I was better at it. You know what I mean? But that's what I'll say. But honestly, because I was just myself, um, unap unapologetically myself, um, I want to wear nice underwear I wear. I want to do makeup. I want to look pretty. And I want to show that you can you can look like me and you can fight. And I know that I could fight. I knew I could fight. I just had to prove it to the world. And um, that fight obviously came out um, – and I got a headbutt in the in in the first in in the second round. She headbutted me, accidental headbutt. <clears throat> so then, by the seventh round, my eye was closed. Um, so then, I, you know, it was a grueling fight, toe to toe. One of the, it's been <clears throat> it's been um, mentioned as one of the best female fights in history. You know, just obviously because of the whole lead up. You know, our real true rivalry. Her giving telling me I don't take the sport seriously because of fucking because of the way I look or because of the way I laundry. Apparently, that means you don't take the sport seriously. But I fucking proved her very wrong. Um, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I couldn't see out of my eye, but because of, um, that she got the win, but I had a lot of people, a lot of people in boxing actually thought that I had won that fight. Um, and they obviously all want to see the rematch because they do believe probably if I had two eyes and, and maybe if it wasn't like, you know, her being the home fighter, then, then I can win that fight. And I totally believe that as well. I believe that I won that fight. It was a great fight, man. It was. That's probably the best female fight I've seen. Yeah. Unbelievable. Like, yeah. The toe to toe. Non stop, yeah, um, just constant punches. How many punches were thrown? Oh, that I don't night? know, but it was a lot. And you know what? The thing is that I got to show the world I did, the, you know, obviously it sucked having that injury. You know, no one ever wants to be injured, you know, um, because you're not you're 100%. But I, I was so happy in a way, I won so much from that fight, even though I lost the I didn't win the belt. I won, I won. No one was even talking about Shannon Courtney. You know, everyone's talking about Blonde Bob and Ebony Bridges, the heart that she has, because not only do they see that I can fight like a fucking little Mexican, like hug, you know, but they also seen that I have heart. And it's not until fighters and people go through that and get those, um, have to go through that adversity where you have an injury where, you know, you can't see or fucking my, my broken ankle or a broken hand and you fight through it that fight fans or people in general see, wow, that's something you can't teach that heart because most people would quit there was heaps of stories you know you know people other fighters men who have quit with less you know what I mean but I was like no I'm not quitting I don't care if I can't see I'm finishing this fight because I don't quit you know and um it just showed and obviously got more fans because it was like wow not only can she fight not only does she look fucking great but she has heart and and she's a real fighter she's a true fighter free spirit of fighting you know what I mean um and yeah so you know um and then from there obviously built the build it and now I'm just 
getting opportunities and keep proving myself over and over again um, and keep grafting. And, you know, God willing, March 26th, I get the world title. You seem to be quite friendly after the fight as well with Shannon Courtney. Shout out to Shannon as well for putting out a great fight and yeah. winning the title. Takes two but to tangle. There was, four, there was yep. photos of you both cuddling yep. and with the belt, was there a, a lot of mutual respect there after the fight? Yeah, I mean, the first thing she said when she came up to me was, wow, I really underestimated you, like as in like, you know, like she did. Um, and I said, you know, you too. Um, but there was a little bit of talk, but no, there's still a fucking very strong rivalry there. She's, she's very much everything that I'm, um, I, 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 not dislike her. Every, she goes against everything that I believe in, which is, um, you know, obviously being you don't, not judging people and, um, being true, true to yourself and, and not putting others down and, and, um, you know, supporting people. So I wouldn't, I'll always have that kind of spite. She's just not my kind of person. I respect her as a boxer you know, for that fight. Um, and, uh, you know, hats off to her. She, she did become a champion. Um, but, yeah, as a, as a person, not so much. See, when you're cutting about in the sex laundry and that, is that a, a method as well? Because you look at Eddie Hearn and it's funny now because when you walk out, he's staring at oh, the yeah, ceiling Hearn, yeah. like, he's fucking like, because there's been so many People footage do, now do I'm looking at your uh, ass. I don't even know if he's looking at no. your ass. He could be looking at somebody yeah. else, but it's the way the photos and stuff get kicked. Know. But do you laugh at that? Yeah. It's, it's clearly business as well. Of you're course. showcasing yourself. Yes. That then opens the doors for sponsors. Yes, it's it's a great tool to utilise it. If you're looking fucking great why not yeah, why not course. expose it to you know the masses um, yeah you know it all came about just because i was a bodybuilder right so i was used to being on stage and a girl, so you're yeah used to cutting about i'm like used that. to being on stage in a fucking g-string flexing posing and i miss bodybuilding and so i actually kind of made my way in like a little kind of mini bodybuilding but be on stage and and pose and and be cute, do my hair, do my makeup, and and show off my hard work body. I don't fucking walk around like that. I'm like that for a week, <laughs> mate. I'm like that for a week. So I, you won't see me in a bikini or outside or showing my skin outside of that week of fight night because I just don't, and I'm not really like that. You know what I mean? Um, but on that week, I'm like I fucking this camp. Like I've worked so hard, my body, I've dieted hard, and I'm gonna show my body off, and I'm gonna do my little quarter turns, my little poses, and be cute and shit like a you know, my front double bicep and get that little um, bodybuilding fix because I still love the bodybuilding stage. I loved it. You know what I mean? I just didn't like the process, but I love the stage. Um, so, yeah, it kind of worked that um, that works, you know, worked for me and and now it's a thing and I feel like people ain't even fucking looking at me anymore. Everyone's too busy <laughs> looking at everyone in the background. They're all waiting to see what Eddie Hearn does or they're waiting to see what all the guys with BBB of C do, the Boxing Border Commission would do. Like, I'm like, hey, guys, remember, I'm the one weighing in here. Uh, but, but you know, you see on all my on all my comments, it's all like, oh, look, at did you see that guy? And like this guy and all, they don't want to get in trouble with their wives. But it is, it's fucking great. And it's, it's another thing for me. It's another thing to connect with my fans. You know, I always ask my fans, what color should I wear? Get them involved. You know, I like being involved with my fans. You know, you, you would have seen me going around doing meet and greets in my time, you know, go around and do that for the fans because I wouldn't be where I am without the fans because it was the fans in 2020 supporting me and yelling my name and screaming out and tagging Eddie every day. We want to see the Blonde Bomber in the UK. We want to see the Blonde Bomber in the UK, you know. They're the ones pushing me and promoting me that help get me over there. If I didn't have the fans, I'd just be a fucking another Aussie boxer that no one even knows about. Do you know how many Australian boxers no. besides George Cambosis probably now? But you wouldn't have known him. Before George winning that undisputed title, you probably didn't even know who he was. Well, he's not undisputed, but whatever. You can, we can argue that. But, you know, uh, you probably didn't even know who he was, you know. But everyone knows who the Blonde Bomber is. And if you didn't know... And if it if I wasn't if I didn't have the fans behind me pushing my name, I would literally just be another no name, you know. So I give back to my fans, and when I can, I want to meet them because I just I know how much it means to them to to see a fan, take a photo, have a little chat, ask them their name. I don't just take a photo. I want to know about them. You know, tell me a little bit about you. You know, tell me whatever. Like give them that time because that's something people will cherish. You know, so and it doesn't take much out of me, and it's my way of giving back and showing my thanks to them as fans because this sport wouldn't be anything without fans and I wouldn't be where I am without the fans so they still promote me now anyways pushing me probably more than Eddie you know what I mean but they do so so yeah shout out to my fans <laughs> how hard was that after the losing the world title for you to bounce back not hard at all um because I was very pleased with my with my performance um I was very happy with what I did um and obviously there was um things to take home and improve but um you know I don't get upset about a loss I'm not the kind of person that dwells on a loss there's always something to learn and um you know back in the gym straight away for me like I said that fight wasn't a loss for me I gained a huge more even more fans I proved a lot of doubters wrong even though I lost I proved whatever all the doubters I had so many doubters doubt me to change their mind. I had people tuning into that fight because of the hype and the build up. 
because of who I am, because of how I pushed that fight, because I wanted people to see me. I didn't want just the women's boxing fans to see me. I wanted everyone to tune in, and they did. You had the football dads tuning in. You had, like, fucking, you know, the young kids tuning in. I had Americans tuning in. I had the Mexicans tuning in. You know, we had everyone tuning in. Eddie came up to me and was like, wow, like, you know, we had people all over the world. I had, like, high-level American boxers message me and say, I lost your fight. It was amazing. These are male boxers that wouldn't even watch fucking female boxing to save their lives. And you know why they watch? But they watch because they see my tits and they see the laundry and they said, I want to see if this girl can fight. Who gives a fuck why they tuned in? But they tuned in and it worked and now they're going to be fans of me and we've got and fans of women's boxing because they've seen that we can fight. Because you need a reason for people to tune into it. You know, fans of, say, football, for example, if they're not a fan of football, how are we going to get them to tune in? you got to, they don't like football. Okay, well, we've got to build something. Cut up out and brown pants, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> How right. is that? Do you feel an added pressure on you because you're like the girl next door as well, the pretty girl? Like who's doing well? That like do you feel added pressure when you're when you're doing that stuff on stage? To then because there must become a lot of jealousy and hate towards that as well. That like, with what? Sorry. Like because of what you do on stage, you're looking great. Yeah. You're, you're you're owning it. You're confident. Yeah. Like does that added pressure on you to succeed and and to be and not just be uh, yes. a one trick pony who's looking great on stage and then goes into the ring and fucking fails? Like yes. Is that added pressure on you? Because um, there must become a lot of jealousy with that as yeah. well. Um, I wouldn't say um, I wouldn't say pressure because I, look I believe in myself I know I can fight so so for me to be on the scales and 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 to look that good um, every time I get in a ring because of the graft that I've done in my camp you know I know that's that's where the real work's done so when I get in the ring I'm always very confident you know what I mean and I know win or lose it's gonna be fucking exciting because of the way I fight I'm, I've got a fan friendly fight style so and that's all I care all I, I want to win I want to be a world champion but what I care about is is entertaining. I'm a boxing fan. I want the fans to go, Ebony Bridges is fighting. Blonde Bombers, fuck, i got to tune in because it's going to be exciting. You know, I want to be that kind of fighter. You know, not just because, oh, it's women boxing, Ebony's fighting. I want people to go, we know no matter what, it's going to be exciting. So, you know, she might not win this one, like, or whatever. I don't care. Tune in because you want it to be exciting and I can I can, I can, can bet my money on that. That's what's going to happen. Not only is my fights exciting, obviously my weigh-ins are fight, exciting, my build-ups is exciting, everything, and that's what I'm about. That's what I want to do. I want to bring excitement to women's boxing because there isn't that much of it, you know. And as for the pressure, I feel like I feel more pressure sometimes to show the other side of me, as in the fucking smart, driven, intellectual, you know, maths teacher kind of, person do you know what I mean because people just see the tits or they just see the the boxing but they don't actually see all the other stuff that I that I do you know the smart and that's why I always dress smart you know I don't walk around in you know whatever like you know what's track it called? Suits. I don't walk around in track suits I, I don't like I look you know I always present myself well and I always like to look smart and um you know because I want to show that there's more to me than just this and that you know, like always in fight week, you know, I, I don't walk around with like low cut tops and I don't, I very rarely wear low cut tops, you know, because um, there's a time for that. And that's when I'm on the scales, you know what I mean? Um, sometimes if I go out, maybe a little bit, you know, I can't hide them all the time. They're just there. But, you know, um, I do try, you know, do um, consciously try, you know, not to be like, okay, he gives me some tits, guys, again, like in your face, like, you know what I mean? Because I am more than that. And I believe I am more than that. There was a time when I thought that's all I was. You know, when I was younger, when I was like, well, you know, like I'm, you know, I've got the boobs and like that's it, you know what I mean? But obviously I've grown and I've matured and yeah. How was it fighting in the Josh Warrington undercard at the Ellen Road? Oh my God. I was at that fight. I'm good friends we, with Josh. I uh, love Josh too, but it's good. Yeah, you know, unreal. Um, I, I, don't, well, I don't know if you're there for my fight, but obviously the Yeah, reception. I was there, yeah. So when I walked out, like, you know, they're all chanting for me, you know, all these army, like, and I was just like, and I only had five days notice, like, for that fight, as in the fans only got told five days out that I was fighting. So for them to be there that early, you know, because I was on the beginning of the card um, and to be chanting and, like, loud for me, like, unbelievable. I was just soaking up the moment. I, I, like, you can see my walkout. I was just like, yeah, I'm, like, listening with them. I'm like, fucking calm down, Ebony. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um but yeah, like it was unreal, and that was my first time fighting UK in front of a big fan base. Rather, because the other times we were in lockdown, you know, so to get that little bit of a taste there um, was pretty epic. And then obviously being there, I've seen Josh Warrington's um, fights um, obviously on on TV, but being there in that atmosphere, well, he worry, 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 worrying. As fucking, you know, as uh, oh as walking, as ring entrance was it's unbelievable. So good, that and was I just, unbelievable. I'm just like, that's what I want, you know, and you know. It's funny, I, I'm probably fucking skitting all over the place, but when I made the, the the decision to want to fight in the UK, 
So I was at um, Wild of Fury because I was building my brand in the US because I already had a fight in the US and I had managers in the US and whatever. Anyways, I was at uh, Fury vs. Wilder 2 in Vegas and there was Brits everywhere. And all I could hear was Pommy accents everywhere. We call them Brits, Pommies, whatever. It's Australian lingo. Um, and they were so loud and I was like, fuck me, this is what I want. I've been to – um, Vegas fights. I've been to fights in America a lot, but it wasn't like that. It wasn't like these British, you know what I mean? And I'm like, man, this is, I need to be fighting in this atmosphere. I want these fans. I, I need to fight in the UK. I don't even care if it's for me. You know what I mean? I was like, I, I just want to be on a fight night to experience this. You know, I had no idea that actually when I was to fight in the UK, eventually in front of fans, that it would be very, it would be for me. I have the fans. They're my fans chanting my name and yelling with me, you know? And so I made that goal in early 2020, in March, it was like February 2020. And I said, okay, what do I got to do? I want to fight in the UK. So I fucking got on Twitter and I started doing interviews with UK YouTube channels. I fucking getting up at two o'clock in the morning, waking up at four, staying up till 12, whatever, you know, doing everything that I could to just push my name out there because I knew I needed to get, in, somehow get, this little blonde Aussie get my name and into the UK market so then I could be known there so then I would be worth but getting over, you know. And so I pretty much it was like eight months after I made, after I decided that that I got my first fight offer in the UK which fell through because of injury. But, you know, it was like I, I made the decision and I did it. It's crazy. It was some card, thank you, Katie Taylor, Connor Ben, Warrington, yourself. Like, it was a great card and it was yeah. a fucking great night. It's just a shame what happened at the end with the injury. But Yeah, I know. So now we're going for an, an, another world title yes. shot. Like, how's the pressure on you? Are you feeling it? Are you excited? It's a little bit, it's definitely, um, I would say it's definitely more pressure on this fight for me um, than, say, my first world title. Why? Because my first world title, I just got the call, hey, can you fit in? Like, it, was a, it wasn't like, it was It was just an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was a late um, replacement for Rachel Ball. Um, and I was like, fuck it, yeah, let's go. You know, like, I'm going to take this with my hands and and and. I believe in myself, give it my best and win or lose, I'm just going to have to give it my best. You know, I don't have the preparation for it, but I'm going to take the opportunity with both hands and make the most of it. But now this time it's like, okay, I need to win this world title. Like, you know, like I do believe that I can win it. I've got the preparation for it. I'm, I'm fighting a champion. She's, like I said, the longest reigning champion in the division, Cecilia Roman. She's um, been champ five years. It's going to be her eighth world title defense. It's not like, you know, I'm fighting for vacant titles. It's not like I'm just fighting a newbie champion she's very very experienced Eddie even Eddie Hearn said you know and he said it numerous times he did he offered me easy fights so I don't want to fuck man I'm not here to fuck spiders I'm not here to fuck around I don't want to have easy fights I want to fight I'm a fighter give me the hard fights give me the challenges win or fucking lose I want to have good fights and um and that's just my mindset and my mentality you know I'm not here for an easy road I, I don't get excited over easy fights you know like I want to I want to you know be inspired when I'm in training. I want to be motivated to train, and it is. I've moved over here with Tibbs, and I'm training. And at the moment, no injuries. It's fucking great. There's no Humpty Dumpty over here. So I mean, we'll knock on wood. We don't get any more injuries, but um, um, everything's going really good, and I'm really motivated, really excited. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just honestly, it's a blessing to get that second second shot at a world title. Um, and I just want to, you know, hopefully win it for the fans. Like for me, it's like me winning that belt. Of course, it's for me, but. I'm all about the people, man. And for me to have that belt, especially like in Leeds, you know, my adopted city. I don't know if you saw me get like, you know, the certificate from the Lord Ma Lord Lair Lord <laughs> Mayor of Leeds. <laughs> I'm officially, you know, a represent representative uh -huh. of um, Leeds City, international representative, and I got a big thank you for that. But yeah, no, to fight in front of the Leeds community, who I who I'd love dearly, um, and also you know, just the people and and get that belt just to prove, you know, anything's fucking possible. Five years ago, I wasn't even boxing. Five years ago, I had my debut, my first amateur fight five years ago. Here I am fighting for my second world title. Anything's possible. We just yeah. got to believe, dream and achieve. Easy work, can it? <laughs> what about what's the preparation getting into this fight and how's Tibbs as a coach? Mate, Tibbs is great. Like, um, it's so good to be here because every other fight that I've had, I've just set it around the world. So from Australia, I go to Philadelphia, I do my camps in Philly and then from Philly I come to the UK and it's been like that. It's so much traveling. But I said, nah, I can't do that. I've got, I got to do all the 1%. So I've got to cut out that shit and i just got to be here. All my sponsors are here. Everything is here. Get settled here. No more time zone adjusting. Just get into it. With Tibbs, it's great. He's he's such a um, – he's got so much knowledge. Do you know what I mean? He's And, and with Tibbs, it's like two in one because I get Jimmy as well. 
you know? So I've got, obviously, Mark Tibbs is my main, but then I've got Jimmy's dad. It's fucking, there's a history there with 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 experience and so much knowledge with, between the both of them. So um, it's great to have, you know, both of them helping me out on looking. I'm also in the gym, you know, obviously with the boys, you know, you've got Johnny Fisher and... Um, Johnny's a good Johnny player. Hedges, Johnny's he's a fucking, he's a legend. But it's great just being there with that environment with people that are just as hungry, you know what I mean? Even um, Tibbs, like he likes me. He's, I'm the first girl he's ever trained. It was funny, I heard him say to his dad the other day, he's like, hey dad, who would have thought that I would be ever training a girl? And who would have thought that you would be okay with me training a girl? Like the ch- times have changed, you know what I mean? Jimmy loves me. Like he always comes up, gives me a hug, gives me gives me advice. And like, you know, they're really, they they love having me there and and, and I love being there. And it's really great because they are old school, you know what I mean? And boxing is old school. You do have these, you know, the old school, like the Jimmy Tibbs, which probably thought never women boxing, like, do you know what I mean? But it's just great to see that transition and for me to come into that gym and be like a breath, breath of fresh air, like they've said, and, and to show, hey, like, you know, women graft hard and we and proving it and it's getting them excited as well. They're like, fuck, you know what? Fuck yeah, like, let's go, bummer. You know what I mean? So, yeah, no, it's great and um, I'm, I'm absolutely loving it. Do you spy men? I do spy men, yeah. I, I, I like to spy men. Um, here in, in the UK, I haven't had to because there seems to be a lot more – kind of tougher smaller girls in philly i'm sparring men a lot of the girls that i spar are a lot bigger it's hard for me to find girls my size to kind of stay in the rounds with me you know i need the rounds and i could not talk myself up but you know i, I hit pretty hard and it's hard to keep them in you know what i mean or keep them coming back around my weight you know so um i'm always sparring a lot bigger girls or i'm sparring the men and i love sparring the men anyways because go toe to toe and they keep me in check you know sometimes the girls i can get a little bit complacent um, but here it's good. I've got some really good sparring partners here. You've got Lauren Parker, who's amazing. Um, you know, Stevie Levy, you know, Nicola Hopo, like they're all really good sparring. I think it's really great for women's boxing here and it's a good position for me to have. So how was that for the students back home when they see a, their teacher on TV? You're proud? Yeah, they love it. They always love it. You know, um, whenever I go back to Australia, I always go back to school when I go back to Australia and, and they always say, oh, we're watching because they all follow me and then I'll bring it up and, and I'll show them my boxing anyways. Like I always bribe them with my boxing, you know what I mean? I'm always like, all right, if you're good, I'll show you one of my fights. And like, okay, miss. I actually had one of the kids, U7, is like, miss, can we have one of your autographs? And I'm like, yeah, you can go online, www.ebonybridges.com. You can buy one for 60 bucks. And and they're like, what? I'm like, you're not even doing your work, mate. Like, you know, I'm not going to give you an autograph for free. You can go buy it. And they're like, so if we do our work, like, do, can we get an autograph? I'm like, yeah. And I'm sitting there in my head. I'm literally thinking I'm going to be able to get that work done. No way. And then they're like, like they're <laughs> full on going for it. I'm like, miss, how, how long have we got? And I'm like, got five minutes. I'm like, is that enough? And I'm like, no, you haven't done it all. Like, you got to do it all. And like, and then they did it and they'll come up and I'm like, you know, just give them, I go, you know what? That's going to be worth so much money because not only is it my autograph, but it's my autograph on schoolwork. You're going to make millions off that. And I expect a cut and I love it. But, you know, like they're cool. They're inspired because they have someone in the school. And like I said, at the moment I teach at a sports school. So they have, um, you know, a lot of the kids are sporties, they know, rugby, football, all that kind of stuff. So they actually have someone in their presence in real life that is actually being successful in sport. And they see the graph that I do and I'm constantly instilling it in their minds as well. You know, I'm pushing my mindset onto them as well. And they see it and it's possible. They believe in it because, well, actually – it's possible, you know what I mean? I told them about where I come from a little bit, you know, like I didn't, you know, wasn't always, you know, where I am and, you know, it's, it's taken work to get here, you know, and um, it's good to have that. It's because I know, and no offence to t- teachers, but you just fucking know who you are. Teachers that have no, absolutely no fucking motivation to teach, they just go there and they just go through the emotions. They can't wait for Friday. They say that Friday's the worst day. The kids are horrible on Friday. That's because you're fucking horrible because you can't wait to get out of fucking school and they can feel that energy. That energy that you that you put of one not wanting to be there and not and think it's Friday, finally it's Friday. The kids are feeling exactly the same because you're projecting that on them. That my classroom's not like that. You know what I mean? The kids love being in the classroom with me because I'm fucking I, I love teaching them. They know that and they can feel that energy. So they want to learn and they want to do good for me as well, you know? And and I, I just, you know, I just feel like it's that that energy is such a big thing for them. And if they, for them to have a teacher that's truly motivating and, and wants to be there, I think inspires them, you know. So, yeah. And let's be true. A lot of teachers, they leave school, then they go to school, and then they go back to school. But they haven't really done much in their life. Yeah. They don't really have anything outside of school and teaching, and that's okay. You don't have to – everyone doesn't have to be ever any fucking bridges. Do you know what I mean? But it's hard to teach this mindset if you don't have it. It's hard to push that onto the kids if you're not doing anything, you know, and that's okay. But – you know, like it, you got to understand, like you know, it is it is hard. And when you do get a teacher like me, I suppose, then it's it's a good, it's a good thing. 
You don't seem to be slowing down anytime soon, but many, how many fights do you think you have left? Um, well, I got four fights left on my contract with, with Matchroom. Um, and then I don't know, I, I maybe two years. I don't know how many fights, but you know, I'm 36 this year. I don't have a family. I really want to have kids. Um, you know, so it just all depends. But again, I'm just taking it as it goes. I have a bit of a plan. If my body can hold out, every camp I have is like, okay, I'm going to make it through camp to fight because of just I am older, you know. And I put myself through fucking hell in my t in, in my twenties with bodybuilding. <laughs> You know, where I didn't give a fuck about oh, stretching, mobility, what's that? Like, no way, I'm too tough, just fucking smash weights and fucking, you know. But now it's like, okay, I'm older and I'm, you know, I've got to be careful. Um, so, yeah, as long as I can keep fighting and it's not detrimental to my health, um, then I'll be doing it, you know. And and obviously, like I said, wanting to have, put some kids in there somewhere. But, yeah, it's, at the moment I'm just riding the, riding the, riding the wave and um, focused on winning this world title. Give me a prediction for the world title. Fight. <sighs> It's going to be so fucking exciting. You know what? I think I can stop her. Um, she hasn't been stopped. But I think I've, me and Tibbs, you know, we've got a plan and, and I'm not going out there for the knockout, but I'm just getting better and better and I really believe that she's going to be in for a bit of a shock um, when she gets hit by me like they all are. You know, they all get in there. They all tell me they're come forward, aggressive fighters. Next minute they're all on the back foot and they're all running from me. So I think um, I do believe that I'm, I am I'm, I will be able to, I can get that that knockout, but no matter what, I'm winning that and my, my hand's being raised because it's my time now and I really believe that. I really believe that... Um, you know, that, that world title needs to be around my waist. For anybody that's watching that's maybe stuck in a dark place, you've been there, you've come out at, what advice would you have for them? Man, just, you know what, tough times don't last, but tough people do. Like, just keep pushing through. There's always, there is always light at the tunnel. You just got to, sometimes you got to look a little bit harder for it, you know, but don't ever give up. You can't give up on yourself. That's the main thing, not giving up on yourself. You know, don't give up on things that you've set out, you know. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, gratitude is huge. You know, it's all mindset. Everything in life, your mind is the most powerful tool that you have. And if you can practice things like positive self-affirmation or even just gratitude or just speaking out. And it's and it's it's like a – it's a skill. Not a skill, but it's something you got to practice because we don't naturally think positive, you know. So you got to dedicate yourself and you got to, okay, I'm going to do this for five minutes a day, you know, and then you build a habit and it's like a habit and then it becomes natural. It's like what I do with the kids, you know what I mean? Like it's it's it's, it's programming them. You got to program yourself, and and it takes discipline and it takes effort because it's not easy to constantly change your mind into positive thinking. It isn't hard, and you got to also accept that there is bad days and it is going to be some bad days, and it's okay to feel down and it's okay to feel, you know, um, have a bad day or or um, you know bad things happen. But you just got to remember you got to pick yourself up, you know, because there's nothing you're not going to get no you're not going to get any anything from staying down there. You know, it's, it's not going to help you from being down there. So find a way out and just yeah, keep pushing through. Where can people get a hold of your social media platforms? What's your links? Yeah, um, so on Instagram, it's ebony, E-B-A-N-I-E -E underscore Bridges or Blonde Bomber. Um, and then Twitter, Ebony Bridges. Um, I've got TikTok as well. I think Ebony, ebony Bridges official or something. I don't, but we will leave the links in the description yeah. anyway, but I think with people watching today... It's not just about all tits and ass with yourself. No. You're not just a great fighter in the ring, but also outside yeah. that to come from where you've come from to what yeah. you're achieving now. Second world title fight, like, it's amazing what you're achieving. I'm Thank proud you. of you. Thank you. Good luck with the fight coming up and for coming on today and telling it. your story. I thoroughly Thank enjoyed you. that and I Thank wish you all the best. Thank you. Appreciate it.